Do you know where we um, So. I know. Northwest of Austin. Hello, gentlemen. Um, my name is Sarah, and I am your friendly room monitor. Um, there are some rules here. We do not throw things at speakers. Please do not throw things at speakers. If you do not have a press badge, please do not take pictures, photos, whatever. That's their job. You know, speakers don't like that. We don't like that. Um, and please be nice and do not heckle the speaker because they're putting a whole lot out there to stand in front of us. So we have to be nice to them because you know we can heckle them later when they're not on stage. Um, and I want to go ahead and introduce Josh Sokol, um, who I don't know at all, but is about to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is risk management. Um, so Josh, please teach us cool stuff we don't know. Sure. Uh, so like you said, my name is Josh Sokol. Uh, I'm happy to take pictures with you guys afterwards. Um, so we can definitely do that. Uh, if you guys want to talk risk, we can certainly talk risk. And if you think that anything that says that anything that I say uh, isn't valid or want to challenge it, I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, but don't call me names. So, <laughs> uh, my role, I'm the information security program owner at National Instruments. I basically handle anything having to do with security uh, from an IT or enterprise perspective, uh, whether it's risk management, vulnerability management, uh, architecture, policy, I, I do it all. Uh, so that's kind of my background. Uh, if you have other questions about that, feel free to let me know. Um, the, the talk here is convincing your management, your peers, and yourself that risk management doesn't suck. And it's kind of unfortunate that we even have to have a talk like this. Uh, but, I, but I think that there, there are enough people in security that just don't understand risk management, they don't understand the value of risk management, uh, and they don't understand how to communicate with management about risk. And so I put this talk together to, to kind of uh, address those things. So I've seen quite a few risk management talks in the past. Most of them have been given by vendors uh, from like Archer. And nothing, nothing against Archer. It's an awesome tool that costs half a million dollars. Uh, and people will buy it. Uh, but they always focus on the process side of it, uh, which is really boring. Um, you know, a lot of us don't just, we don't care about the process stuff. Um, proper risk management is about using risk to drive organizational improvement. And so everything that we do when it comes to risk should really be focused on what's the end result. How do we use this to improve the organization, to drive the business, to make more money, uh, and be successful? Um, risk management can actually be interesting and extremely, extremely valuable. Um, you know, I, I met Sarah a few minutes ago, and she was like, I love risk. Risk is awesome. Some people get it. And I think risk absolutely can be interesting, and, and it is extremely valuable. So real quick, show of hands, who here has an existing risk management program? All right. Who is interested in starting a risk management program? Hopefully everybody's hands go up, right? If, if not, you're in the wrong place, right? Um, so let's start off and talk about personal risk management, because I think this kind of gets the idea across. And I'm happy to share my notes with anybody. If you want to copy the slides, we can talk afterwards. Um, personal risk management, this is something that you guys do without even realizing it. Um, you have property, you have cars, you have houses, things like that, and you have to make decisions uh, in your daily lives about how you're going to protect those things. What are the risks involved with owning those things, and how do you mitigate those risks? So when it comes to my house, I have nice things. I have a TV that I like very much, I have pets that I love, and those things are important to me, and I want somebody to come and take those things. Fortunately, I live in a nice neighborhood, so I don't have to put bars over the windows. I don't feel the need to put fences up and things like that. But there's still a risk of somebody coming to my neighborhood and targeting me. So I've made a risk assessment. I've said that, that there's a certain level of things that I need to do to mitigate the risks to my home, to my property. And so what do I do? I put an alarm system in. I get a firearm, right? These are all things that I need to do to protect my things. Risk management in the enterprise is the exact same thing. You are trying to figure out what are the things that could affect our enterprise, what are the things that could cause problems for us, and how do I address those, right? So let's talk about threats and consequences. Risk is, it covers all facets of the business. It's not just security, right? Um, it, it covers all sorts of different things. And because of that, there are different types of threats and different consequences that create risk for us. 
So up here we have things like financial loss. Now financial loss just means that some risk could result in losing money. It might be that my company likes to play the stock market and we invest in something that loses all of our pension funds, right? That is a financial loss risk. We could have things like reputation damage, where let's say we lose credit cards, right? That could potentially affect the reputation of my company. We also have levels of consequence when we're talking about risk. So just because something happens doesn't mean that it's uh, extremely impactful. It doesn't mean that it's not. So we have to look at each individual risk, we have to figure out what's the likelihood of that thing happening, and then if it does happen, what's the consequence? What's the impact to us? Some other things here, regulatory non-compliance, business interruption, safety hazards, these are all different types of risks. So in ideal risk management, it's a prioritization process. We want to go, we want to look at the likelihood of the event happening, we want to look at the impact when it does happen, and then we basically calculate that. And we say the things that fall to the extremes, the things that are almost certain to happen and that are uh, extremely impactful if they do happen, those are the things that we likely want to address first. There's another component here, which is what's the level of effort? Is it gonna cost a million dollars to address something that's you know, a, a relatively small risk? We have to take in that into consideration as well. But if we do risk management right, what ends up happening is we get something like this, where we're able to kind of rank our risk and say this is the most important thing or the, the thing that has the most likelihood of happening and is going to be the most impactful. And we chart those on a graph and we're able to say, number one, we have to hit that first because it's way up there. Then we do number two, then we do number three, four, five, etc. There's lots of different risk management methodologies out there. Um, my risk management practice is based a lot on the NIST 800-30 framework. The problem is there, there's lots of things out there, right? There's lots of different strategies. Everybody's gonna tell you, you know, do this, do that. The problem is there's somebody else's vision of what risk management should be. And every organization is unique. My organization is different from Nate's organization, from Sarah's organization, from Andy's organization. So at best, these risk management frameworks out there are a guideline. They give you examples of what others are doing. At worst, they end up making risk management look overly complicated. They make it difficult to get started because the frameworks are so heavy. So starting out, we need to define risk. Right? And we've talked a little bit about this. Risk is the potential that a chosen action or activity, including the choice of inaction, will lead to a loss or some undesirable outcome. I think the important thing for us to understand as security professionals is that piece in parentheses there, including the choice of inaction. Management can choose to do nothing about our risk. They can say that risk exists, we acknowledge that it's there, but hey, it's not worth our effort, the impact is minimal, they have that choice. And I think as security practitioners, we need to understand that that's a choice for management to make. And I think far too often we go and we say the sky is falling, or we have to address this because PCI says so, or whatever. We need to understand that, that those are risks that management is willing to take. And we have to figure out how best to support those decisions. Risk can apply to all sorts of different areas. You can have eco economic risks, you can have health, safety, and environmental risks, IT and infosec, insurance, business, finance, security. It's all over the place. So when we're talking risk management, what risk management is to me, as an information security professional, may be very different from the risk that uh, somebody in the banking industry or the securities industry is talking about. Or even within my organization, we have guys who are in charge of health and safety. They, they've uh, tracked OSHA compliance, right? Those guys care about different risks than I care about. Ideally, within your enterprise, you want to figure out how do I standardize on a platform that can address everybody. So when we're talking risk formula, we already talked about likelihood and impact. The way that you classically uh, calculate risk is with a formula likelihood times impact. So you get something like this. You say, 
the likelihood, if the likelihood is remote, I assign that a value of a one. And you go all the way up to almost certain, which is a value of five. And on the impact scale, you say insignificant is a one, and extreme or catastrophic is a five. And now you go through and you say, for this particular risk, what is the likelihood, what is the impact? Multiply those two out, you get a value. Now you can chart that value on the scale. Now you can actually compare one risk to another risk to another risk. Now the interesting thing is, while that's the classic risk formula, and if you take your CISSP, remember that one, it can change. Remember when I started out, I said that risk is different for different organizations. So make your risk formula fit you. And what I mean by that is you can manipulate that formula. You can weight impact. You can say risk is actually the likelihood times impact plus impact. And what that does is it actually skews that scale. It skews it more towards that impact. So your impact actually weights more into your risk scale. Or you could go the other way. You could weight likelihood. And now it kind of flips the other way. You can even do things like extreme impact weighting. And you can say likelihood times impact plus impact plus impact. Make your formula fit you. And that's important, because if, if you are able to make your formula fit you, that's something that management can then kind of wrap their, their arms around. They can say, well, you know, this old thing, we, that likelihood was, uh, you know, it, it just skewed the scale. And you're like, well, we don't want likelihood to skew the scale. So we add an impact, an additional impact. Be flexible. So risk management needs to be a custom fit for your organization. And your formula needs to reflect that, right? Your formula can and likely will change. And the interesting thing about this is a lot of the, the people out there who are managing risk, they're actually managing it with spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets. And it's, I mean, Excel is somewhat flexible. You can make it so that if I plug a new value in here, then it does this. You can kind of change formulas. But you need, whatever you're doing, however you're tracking risk, you need to be, you need to have that ability to dynamically change to modify the formula on the fly and have that update all the risks. So static things like Word documents and whatnot, I instantly throw those out the window. They don't work. Wherever you're tracking risks, you should be able to dynamically update it based on your new formula. All right, so now let's talk about convincing management. Because risk management will ultimately fail if you don't have management participation. I had a long conversation last night about risk management with a, a couple different people. And I, fortunately, the, the person I talked to is extremely passionate about risk management. We actually saw, saw eye to eye on a lot of things. One of the key things that kind of came out of that conversation is that management doesn't speak CVE. They don't speak attack vectors. They don't speak threat trees. Those are security professional tools to assess risk. What management does speak is risk. So if you can frame it in a context of risk, was the likelihood of something happening, was the impact if it does happen, that is something that management can understand. That's the way that management communicates. All this other stuff is ways that you assess the likelihood and impact. Your responsibility as a security professional is to collect and convey risk to management. It's not your job to sign off on risk. It's not your job to um, go and, and force people to do things, right? Your job is to collect the issues, assess what the likelihood and impact is of that risk happening, and then pass that along to management and say, here are the facts. What would you like to do about this? And use your expert opinion to guide management. Management's responsibility is to evaluate how to respond to those risks. Do they accept the risk? Do they transfer the risk? Do they reduce the risk? If you can get management involved in these decisions and make this a risk-based conversation with management, they're gonna feel empowered. Management will feel like you are giving them the ability to see all this information that they didn't have visibility into before, and you're giving them the ability to actually make decisions on things that you kind of made for them previously. If you do a good job of guiding management through the risk analysis process, the end result is a list of priorities based on those risks that you can then uh, 
narrow down into a project. And now you can feed this directly back to management and say, here's all of our projects that I think we should work on next year. Right? We should plan for these in the budget. And that's based on risk. How can management say no to that? These are projects that address these risks. Right? It's very real. Convincing your peers. Oftentimes, security practitioners have trouble communicating with their peers. And it almost becomes an adversarial relationship where these guys, they're, they're working tirelessly. Our system administrators, they're doing the best job they can with the resources that they have. So if I go up to these guys and say, you're not doing good enough. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. It becomes a very adversarial relationship. And if you don't have peer participation in the risk management process, risk management will fail. So your job is to get these guys on your side. Management can only be proactive in addressing risks if they're aware that the risk exists. So you need to be friends with these guys. You need to convince them that this is effectively a cover your own ass opportunity for them. If they can convey their risks to you, you tell them, I will document these risks, I will make sure the management review these risks, it's a weight off of their shoulders. These guys no longer have to carry that burden on their own. And if that risk actually happens, they can say, look, I told you. I told you it was that. We said, was this likely to happen? This was going to be the impact. And you chose to accept the risk, Mr. Manager. Right? You did not allocate the funds to this. Get them on your side. Let them know that this is actually something that's going to help them, not hurt them. Document risk means that management acknowledges that the risk exists, and any action or inaction is now on their shoulders instead of the shoulders of your peers. So when we're determining the risk, we want to convince our peers that this is a CYOA approach, and that you'll, have, you'll end up having more risk than you know what to do with. If you get them bought in, they will come to you with new stuff. Hey, I just discovered this in my environment. Can you document it for me? Make sure that management reviews this. You can also determine risks other ways. So we all have network vulnerability scanners. We have app vulnerability scanners. Um, security mailing lists are a good way for this. Security blogs, code reviews, Twitter. How many of you guys use Twitter to, to track? Yeah. It's actually a fantastic source of information about what the latest risks are. What's the new threat? If you're following Twitter right now, they're like, Hey, I just saw this presentation at Black Hat. Crap, I have to fix that, right? So lots of different ways that we can determine what our risks are. Now the question becomes, what do we do with them once we collect them? We have to evaluate it. So we look at that risk and we say, is this something that we're willing to accept? Is the likelihood or impact low enough that I'm willing to just accept the consequences if it actually happens? And like I said, this is something that we as security professionals have to accept. The fact that management says, I understand that that could happen, but it's okay. If it does happen, we'll deal with the consequences. That's a perfectly acceptable answer. Ask, is the risk transferable? Unfortunately in security, a lot of times it's not. We can't buy insurance for this kind of stuff. Right? If, well, you, you can buy like data breach insurance, but it doesn't really fix that stuff. It just covers some costs while you're down or you know, for somebody to investigate. But the idea is, can I purchase insurance or something to measure, uh, some other measure to transfer impact of the risk to somebody else? Is the risk reducible? Is there some sort of mitigation that could be put in place to reduce the impact or likelihood of the risk? And that's actually a, what we should try and focus on as security professionals. We have to be willing to, to admit that the risk is acceptable, but if we're doing our job right, if we're convincing management that we have their best interests in mind, if we're speaking their language, we should be able to talk to management and say, I feel like if we do this, if we install a web application firewall, it'll address all these risks, and I, I think we'll be in a better position for that. We can talk their language. We can reduce those risks. So when we're trying to determine the response, we look at something like this. Is it acceptable? Is it transferable? Is it reducible? So if the answer is no to all three of those things, the answer should be clear. Don't do this. 
if I can't accept it, I can't transfer it, I can't reduce it, that's where you kind of put your foot down. That's where you tell management, I really feel like we shouldn't be doing this activity. If it happens, bad things happen, we can't accept those bad things, we can't buy insurance for it, and there aren't any mitigations for it. All the way down to if we can do all three of those things, well, we can balance them, we can optimize. So when we're looking at a risk, we have to kind of evaluate these things on a per risk basis. Risk management is not a process for avoiding risk. The idea is to catalog you want to figure out what the risks are and you want to manage them. And you want to manage them in ways to maximize business opportunities and minimize adverse effects if those risks come true. Risk management is not the management of insurable risks. It's a way of transferring risks, but most risks are managed by other means, reducing or accepting. Risk management should support strategic and business planning. So if you as a security professional are talking risks, but you're not asking business what they need, what their goals are, and your policies aren't in line with that, you're gonna fail. It should support the effective use of resources. Remember that our end goal is prioritization, and we wanna turn these into projects that we can justify via the risks. It should promote continuous improvement. We wanna explicitly address uncertainty. And the idea, idea there is that we get fewer shocks. If we tell management that this could happen, even if it's a remote possibility that it could happen, they at least are aware of that possibility. It allows us for a quick grasp of new opportunities, enhances communication between the business, between IT, between senior management, because we're finally communicating using the same language. It gives reassurance to our stakeholders. It helps us to focus internal audit programs. It should create value. If security uh, practitioners aren't seen as adding value to the organization, if all you are in inhibiting the business, that's a problem. So we want to figure out, as security professionals, can we provide services? Can we do things that make the business value what we're doing? You want to be an integral part of organizational processes, be a part of decision making systemic and structured, based on best available information, tailored, taking into account human factors, transparent and inclusive, dynamic, iterative, and responsive to change. Now the interesting thing is this isn't a one and done kind of thing. Risk management needs to be cyclical. And what I mean by that is that there's different pieces to the risk management process. And if you only do those once, what happens when that risk changes? So take uh, you know, one of the, the vulnerabilities, one of the exploits that gets dropped at Black Hat this week. That vulnerability today is pretty bad. There's no fix for it. Um, it's gonna affect all these users, data disclosure, whatever. Now two weeks from now, when the vendor goes, oh shit, and patches that, does the risk go up or does it go down? it goes down, which means that there's actually a temporal component to risk. What it is today, it's not layer up. So we have to learn how to address these on a regular basis. So step one, we identify, characterize, and assess the threats. What are the threats facing us today? Step two, assess the vulnerability of our critical assets to those specific threats. If the threat is targeting Windows, but all of my systems are Linux-based, is that a risk? Probably not. Probably not something that I care as much about. So we determine the risk, and then we want to identify ways to reduce those risks. How do we mitigate against these? Then we prioritize risk reduction based on a strategy, and we take into concern business constraints. And what I mean by business constraints is usually resource stuff. Do I have people's time to fix this? Do I have the money to do it? And then you go back. You start talking to more people, you get more threats, you look at the whole thing again, and you keep going year over year. 
So a risk review process may depend on how lean your organization is on management structure. What I've done at National Instruments is I've created a structure that allows me to elevate, elevate the visibility of risk to the people I feel should have that visibility. So in our case, we have area managers, and I've made those guys able to accept low-level risks. These are things that are relatively unlikely to happen, and if they do happen, impact is pretty low. So giving them the ability to sign off on that, it doesn't remove visibility from executive management, it just puts accountability on those people. Now as we move up that risk level, and we start getting to more medium, I like those to go to my directors. I like the directors to have the visibility, I like them to be the ones who sign off on it, and they help to, they're the guys who are gonna create the budgets for the organization and make sure that, say, that uh, projects are being allocated, so they should have that level of visibility. Now, if we get all the way up into that high level risk, these are things that are extremely likely to happen, and if they do happen, it's gonna be really bad. Don't you think your executive management wants to know about that? I do. So those are things that I hand off to my VP. I say, these are the things that have bubbled up of our risk management process as things that I think we should really care about, you should really care about. Let's sit down and let's talk about these. Let's talk about the likelihood, let's talk about the impact, and let's figure out ways to fix this. Now for me, I also feel like risk should be reviewed on a regular basis. Because as we talked about, risk changes over time. So a high risk, because of the nature of being a high risk, might be something that we want to review every month. Sit down, let's talk about this guy. Is it still valid? Did we put a mitigation in place? A medium level risk might be something that we review on a semi-annual basis. And a low risk, because of its nature, we might just say, well, let's review it every year. Let's take a look at that risk every year. Is it still valid, yes or no? Do we care more today? Has it changed? Now, in order to derive value out of this, we order those risk by risk level. If the mitigations are the same, so if all my risks bubble down to identity and access management, I group those together. And then we take those risks and we pass them back to the various teams and say the directors have reviewed these risks, these all boil down to this project, and that project has now been approved for funding in our next budget cycle. We've now added value directly back to the organization. By giving up some of the goods, our coworkers, our peers, by being a little bit uh, giving with that, we've now enabled them to have money and time to fix this stuff. Isn't that what we all want? We want to fix this stuff. All right, the area that I feel like most security practitioners will fall down for risk management is in tooling. And the reason being, right now, most of us use spreadsheets. Because they're free, relatively. They're extremely easy to access, but they suck. How many of you guys are using spreadsheets? The other side of the coin here for risk management in the enterprise is large platforms. They call them governance, risk, and compliance, and they address more than just the risk piece. Easily 100K. I said that number, I was uh, at dinner with the WebSense guys the other night, and I said 100K, and they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, no, 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 that's easily half a million dollars. These tools are extremely expensive, they're extremely bulky, they do way more than basic risk management needs them to do. And that ends up being a problem. Any of you guys actually have a large platform like that? Archer? Yeah. None of us can afford it. Let's be honest. If I, if I tell my management I actually did this, I said, I need Archer GRC so that I can do proper risk management. And they saw the, the price tag on and they literally laughed at me. <laughs> they, they laughed at me. It didn't feel good. But when that, when that tool, one tool, comes out to about double my security spend, that's bad. They're not gonna green light that. 
I tried. I was like, okay, well, if I can't justify this for me, why don't I go and I'll get the trade compliance guys involved and I'll get the health and safety guys involved and I'll get all these other stakeholders that care about risk, I'll get them to buy into this. And I did, I sat them down, we talked about risk management. They're like, yeah, let's get a tool. And then I handed them the number that I was gonna take to buy this thing. They're like, we don't have budget to support that. It just doesn't happen unless if you're a huge Fortune 100 corporation, you can't afford that. Is anybody using anything else for risk management? Spreadsheets, large platforms, does anybody have another solution? Yeah. This is what I mean when I say that, that it usually falls down around that tool set. So we talked about that. This is the point of my presentation where hopefully you guys are getting it and uh, angels are warming up their voices. So I got, I, I realized that this is a problem. I don't wanna deal with spreadsheets. Those suck, I can't afford Archer. I need a better way. And so what I ended up doing is I sat down. Uh, my collegiate background is computer science, so I have some programming skills. I've studied web application security, so I know how to write a relatively secure application. And I sat down and started writing some PHP code. And I maybe sat down for eight hours, 10 hours, something like that. And I wrote something where I could just click submit and submit a risk. I was like, this is cool. All right, that's already better than a spreadsheet. If I can submit it into a database, now I can track it via database. Cool. So I started writing some reporting around this. And I was like, okay, well, you know, how many risks do I have there? What's open, you know, what's closed? How do I track this? And then I started adding more and more pieces to this thing. And I was like, wow, I have something here. This is extremely valuable for me at National Instruments. Maybe this is valuable to other people too. So what I've done is created something that I affectionately call simple risk. And simple risk is free, it's open source, uh, it's PHP and MySQL, so it's easy access. Uh, based on, you know, if you if you want to run on Windows, you can run on Windows, you want to run on Linux, you can run on, on Linux. But it's extremely simple to use. And it's not meant to be a huge GRC platform, it's meant to catalog risk, and it's meant to keep keep track of some of these things like mitigation and management reviews. So I'm logging in with my admin account. This is running on LAMP stack, this is Ubuntu. I actually put uh, together a how to install it on LAMP stack manual that you can probably run through in 30 minutes and have an active simple risk install on a Linux box. This is running on my local system, so this is a virtual machine, but you can spin it up anywhere in your environment. You can put it on an existing stack, it doesn't matter. So the first thing you see here when I open it, I only have one risk in there. And I entered this guy earlier just so that I had something so that the graphs would show up. But you can see, all right, we got some reports here. We can see the status of the risk, and this will change as we do things like um, create a mitigation or create a management review. You can see where this risk is located. It's located at East Side Las Vegas. You can see the category it falls to, which is physical security. I categorized my team as information security, and technology was off. I don't have any closed risk in here right now. So the process for risk management, well, let me go into here. So just like I talked about in the presentation, I wanted this to be flexible. I wanted it to be something where when I went in there and I decide all of a sudden that I didn't like my likelihood times impact model, I could change it. So I've actually built in a couple of other models as well. Likelihood times impact plus impact plus likelihood. You can do the weighting stuff. And if you select one of these things, like if I do two times impact, and I hit update, it changes. It actually changes my model there. I can also do things here, like change what I consider to be low, medium, and high level risks. So if I decide that a low level risk is actually something greater than two, and anything below that is insignificant, I don't care about those things, I change that to two, and my risk model changes on the fly. All of my risks updated with my new model. 
So we can go through and we can very easily customize this to ourselves and it changes that ball on the fly. Review settings, we talked a little bit about this. I want, like I said, this is what I do for my organization. But what fits me doesn't fit you. So you can set these things to whatever you want. You can say I review high risk every week. I review low risk every five years, right? So it's flexible. I wanted it to be customizable. I wanted you to be able to create your own categories, add your own teams into there, your own technologies. There's user management features in here, so you can actually create users for it. And then you can say, well, this guy's able to submit risk, but he can't review high, medium, and low, low level risk. All he can do is submit. Or this guy is able to submit risk and modify risk and plan mitigation. Oh, this other person, he just has access to the configure menu. So he's able to make these changes. Role-based access controls. And you can go in and you can look at different users. You can assign them to different teams. You can change their responsibilities. You can update passwords, things like that. You can change my naming conventions. So I got insignificant, minor, moderate, major, and extreme or catastrophic for my impact. If you don't like those, type, those terminologies, if uh, insignificant is really, I don't care, Done. Insignificant is now I don't care, right? So super easy to change things. I've created an audit trail. This is actually uh, one of my buddies is an auditor, and he saw this and he was like, Josh, that's great. How do I know who did what? He's like, you're right. As security professionals, we need to be able to track who's doing these things. So there's a full audit trail in there. Each individual risk tracks its audit trail. And then as an administrator, you're able to go into here and see what everybody on the system is doing. It even has an about thing. They'll actually go through, it's not gonna work right now because I'm not connected to the internet. They'll connect out and say, what's the latest version of Simple Risk? Am I up to date? So the risk management piece is meant to be as simple as possible. You submit your risk. You go in here and you can say, um, give me a good risk. What do you think? You guys are quiet. PCI auditor is PMSing. <laughs> PCI auditor. I don't know. PMSing works for me. We give it a location, and these you can define in that configure section. So we're going to say at B sides Las Vegas. We give it a category. So is this access management, environmental? probably policy and procedure. Technology, where does this live? We're gonna just say. Uh, and you can define your technologies under there, right? Yeah, like you can change all that stuff, software. absolutely. Owner, so right now I, I didn't create any other users, so we're just gonna say admin. If you wanna leave it blank, you can do that. Risk scoring. So we talked about classic, mm -hmm. likelihood times impact, classic risk. And you can rate it based on that. But I had a buddy who was like, what about application vulnerability? What about technical vulnerability? I use CVSS. I was like, all right, let's build in CVSS scoring. So I actually built in CVSS scoring for simple risks. And you can go through and it asks the same questions that you would do for a CVSS score. What's my attack vector? Is it local? Is it adjacent network? Is it network based? What's my complexity? High, medium, low? So you can take these things, you can enter them, and when you submit it, you get a CVS score instead of the classic risk model. So it's almost certain that PCI auditors, if it's female, men You know what, honestly, I deal with more male PSAs. I know like two female PSAs. Yeah. Yeah, but they PMS too. They do, you're absolutely <laughs> right. So it's almost certain, I, 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 I think so. And then when we're looking at the impact, otter. we give it an assessment, this makes, Makes my job unbearable. All right. We can put additional notes in here. We hit submit. We're submit. Done. That easy. So what we what we do next? Mitigations. Higher so we go PCI we go in here. Here's our list of things. Okay. We were talking earlier about you know no throwing things at people. So I put a risk in there. I said, what happens if someone throws something that knocks me out? That would suck, right? So we got our PCI auditor in here. 
based on our classification, our likelihood and our impact, this came out as a six. And we can see it color coded as orange, that's the medium level risk. And in this menu, we see anything that needs mitigation. So we click on mitigation plan no, and now we get a planning strategy. Do we want to research it, accept it, mitigate it, or watch it? Well, in this case, let's mitigate. And what's our mitigation effort? Trivial, minor, considerable? Eh, probably trivial. Current solution, we don't really have that. But my security recommendations are hire a new auditor. <laughs> Who is cute? Yes, we like that. Who we can tolerate We're a little bit. We're stuck with them in a room for an entire week. They have to be scenic. I'm sorry. Uh, that's, like, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So at least we can deal with our PMS for Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So we hit submit. Done. Now if we go back into this mitigation menu, it's gone. Why? Because we put mitigation in there. Easy. Management reviews. Here's everything that needs a management review. We can already see mitigation was planned for this. I'm a manager, let's review it. Do you want to approve this risk or reject it? Seems valid to me, let's approve it. Now that we've approved it, what do we do? Do we accept it until the next review? This is kind of the, yeah, that's a risk, but I don't want to do anything right now. Do we consider it for a project? Do we need a new project to, uh, to hire a new auditor? Maybe. Or do we submit it as a production issue? Seems like a production issue to me. We can put some comments in there or not. We hit submit. Again, disappeared from our view. Now, if we go in here, I didn't do it, but if when we're doing our management review, we say approve, we say consider for project, what ends up happening is we get in our unassigned risk bucket. So now, someone throws something that knocks me out, um, we're gonna create a bodyguard project. I'm gonna have somebody stand right here he's going to take the bullet for me. So we add that. We've got a new bodyguard project. We take that guy, we drag it into the bodyguard bucket, we save it. Bam! No more unassigned risks. We have our bodyguard project, we're good. We can prioritize, so if I have multiple things, I can drag and drop. They don't actually change the, the organization there. I'm building in another component that will let me categorize the projects. What's active, what's inactive, that kind of thing. So now we review our risks. And based on my settings, you know, how often do I want to review these based on the risk level, it automatically gives it an extra review date. So medium level risk, this is every six months. So it gave us a date of January 2014. My low level risk, that's every year. So it gave me July next year. Makes sense. That's how easy risk management is, or at least how it should be. We've got some additional reporting in here. So we've got nice little dashboards. We can turn little sections off. We can see what our breakdown is in terms of technology, things like that. You can have re uh, reporting on open level risks, closed level risks, all sorts of things. Um, if you go into well, any of these guys, I look at my open risk, you can actually click on one of these guys. And now you see all the information about that. What's the details of this? What's my mitigation? When's my last review? You can view all reviews because you have to do reviews on a regular basis. You can edit any of these guys, assuming you have the permission. You can perform a new review. You can add a comment. So there's comments on the bottom here. And you can close risk if it's something we fix. So in this case, let's close this risk. Fully mitigated, new hottie acquired. Now, if we look back at our open risk report, that guy's no longer there. We can look at our closed risks, there it is. So hopefully, as a result of simple risk, risk management no longer becomes a tool problem. And as security practitioners, we can go, we're no longer worried about our tool set, so we can actually do risk management. We can focus our efforts on that instead of trying to find a tool that fits us. So, with that, I'm done. I have some simple risk stickers up here, if you guys like stickers. When are you gonna make a Takajira? You need to make a Takajira. I do need to make a Takajira. You totally need to make a Takajira. Yes. That project shit, that so, would be so much better. So, there are a lot of things that I think 
need to get built into it. Yes, you also need to make a time account for it. I, I am a father of four. Okay. I don't have a lot of time. If there are other people out there who would like to help with this initiative, I'm more than willing to take on some other people to help out. If you know PHP code. Um, I think that there's other ideas too, which is importing from Rapid7 Expos, importing from White Hat. Right? These are all risks to our environment. And if we can use something like this to manage them, all the better. Um, in any case, I have stickers, I have some business cards that, that all say simple risk on them. Um, are there questions? Yeah. Do you go to the level of inputting every single vulnerability, or would you just say the risk is box is going to get popped by vulnerability? So if it were me doing risk management, like I said, this is different for everybody. But if it were me, I wouldn't categorize every cross-site scripting vulnerability on my website. No point in that. Um, what I would do is say that cross-site scripting, or, or rather um, the impact to the user from cross-site scripting, is a significant risk. Right? And that, uh, those code deficiencies, poor input validation, whatever, those could result in compromises of our user base, which ultimate, ultimately means bad PR for us or stolen user accounts or whatever. That's the risk. Those are the things that I would put in there, not the individual vulnerability. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Other questions? No? All right. Can you well, put an icon customization? I'm sorry, I don't code at all. So you I want to brand that. it. I want to be able to put a pony on it, actually. I want to talk to Jira, I want to be able to put a pony on it. Yeah? Yeah. All right. So it's PHP code. Okay. It's open source. It's easy. Um, I would say that, that so, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, Mozilla Public License 2.0, which basically means that you can take my code and you can rewrite it, build it, turn it into your own product, uh, whatever you want to do with it, I've got no issues with that. There are some additional things that I'm going to be doing here that probably will be more enterprise focused, mm -hmm. like Active Directory authentication, That'd for example. Um, I might charge a little bit of money to help support feeding my kids, right? Support the effort. But I wanted to make sure that the basic risk management, every single thing that I've shown you here, free, open source, in the thing right now, if you go to simplerisk.org, you can download it today and have it up and running tonight. I promise you that, right? So with that, I'm open for questions afterwards, but thank you guys so much.